I'm Jeff Kisseloff. It's April 12, 1997. I'm interviewing Ray Forrest, and we're here in New York, New York. Here we go. Um, I forgot your name. What's your name again? Ray Forrest. And um, what was your birth name? It happened to be Feuerstein. It was not Forrest at the time because I'm a German immigrant. What's your, what was your, fir, fir, your full name? Yeah, Raymond. Raymond E. Feuerstein. And where were you born? In Germany, in a place called Wuppertal Barmen in and, Germany. And what was the date? Uh, January 7, 1916. Now, what brought your family to this country? Oh, going back to about 1903, after my father had uh, fulfilled his military obligation, which all people, all men over there were in, uh, had to do. It was a compulsory thing, and he was in the cavalry. Right after he had finished that, he came to this country to visit a sister and uh, fell in love with the United States and decided then and there that this was the place he wanted to be. He learned English in about a year that he was here, and uh, among the jobs that he took at the time, were uh, such things as being a bricklayer because he had to support himself. So uh, when he went back to Germany, he started a business which was in gifts and jewelry and musical instruments. And uh, during that time, oh, it must have been about uh, 1911 or 12 thereabouts, he met some. Uh, gentlemen from Salt Lake City who were Mormon missionaries. And my father was chosen to be the guide for these guys. They liked each other immediately and uh, got along very well. And uh, they sort of forgot about each other except by correspondence. And uh, came 19, I think it was 1913, when he decided that uh, this was the time to make the break and try to take his family to the United States. And he got on the list, got on the quota, to be able to bring them over. So he came over first in 1913 to start uh, looking around for a place to establish a business and uh, went back to Germany to collect the family, got over there, and they said, no way, you're going in the service because I guess war at the time seemed fairly imminent. So he went into the uh, army and into the cavalry, which is what he was trained in, and uh, one of his favorite stories he used to tell was in the very beginning, here they were, they were still using horses in those days, and uh, he and a uh, hundred men were sent on a mission into what were then enemy lines, and he and the men were ambushed. And out of a hundred guys, 11 of them made it back, including my father. And the only reason he wasn't uh, wiped out was that his horse was shot out from under him and he was able to hide behind the horse and make it back alive. How did he when, immigrate here permanently after the war? Well, uh, after four more years of all this kind of business, including trenches and what have you, he uh, decided that uh, he would try once again to emigrate uh, into the United States and got back on the quota, which at that time was a difficult thing to do because you couldn't just walk in and say, I'd like to be here. So by 1923, 24, he again got the okay to bring the family over here, which he did. And uh, after he was established in Patterson, he corresponded with and got some uh, letters from these fellows that he had met in Germany, who were out in Salt Lake City, and uh, met the son of one of these gentlemen, a fellow named Ben Larson, who wanted very badly to get into the radio business in New York. So when he decided he wanted to come east, this is about, oh, I guess about 1929. He, uh, we were the only people he knew in the entire East. So he, Ben lived with us for about a year. And uh, he was sort of like an older brother to me. 
Would since he take I had you him. to the radio studio? And he then started working in New York. Mm -hmm and uh, in relatively short time became a producer and director of radio programs, among them the Rudy Valley Show from 7-Eleven Fifth Avenue, and uh, the Milton Berle sing-along show, and a lot of others. And he thought that it would be great if I could get into that kind of business. And I certainly agreed with him, rather than staying out there in the jewelry business. Did he take you into the radio studio? Would you watch the program? I frequently came in and watched the programs. Was and, it exciting? And it was just wonderful because I got to meet a lot of people and uh, got the feel for the industry, which was pretty exciting. Hmm. So... Uh, and and what did... Did you think at that point that radio would be the career for you? I, you at that point, I didn't really know because I was pretty young, mm -hmm. and in my first year of high school, I guess, and uh, I didn't know what direction I would go into, but by that time, Ben had gotten established in New York, and I was about to flunk every course that I was taking in high school, and I knew that if I did, my father would grab me by the shoulder and say, that's enough of that business, you're gonna go to work. But uh, about the holidays, about Christmas time, I bumped into a good friend of mine. I had gone to school with a fellow named Mel Bernstein, who was uh, in this marvelous cadet uniform. And I said, gee, Mel, what is that? And what, what do you do? And he said, oh, I go to this great military school. He really didn't like it a lot, but he thought he'd like company. And it's a place called Stanton Military Academy in Virginia. So uh, it wasn't a very difficult job to convince my father that uh, I should go to this military school. And with his background, he thought, boy, if, uh, and I said, I stand a pretty good chance of becoming an officer. Because at that time, it was a very highly rated school. And uh, it was possible to do that. So sure enough, that uh, January, I enrolled at uh, SMA. And my professor of military science and tactics at the time was a fellow named Major Patch, who had been a lieutenant colonel in World War I. And uh, in any case, I stayed there for uh, oh, four years of in military science and tactics. Until when? When did you graduate? Uh, I actually left the school in 1936. I went a little extra. To complete the four years of uh, PMS and T, right. and then that summer, I spent the entire summer at what is similar to an OCS, an officer candidate school, and even the guys from VMI and VPI all had to go there for that entire summer. Now, how did you make the leap into into NBC at that point? When I got through with that uh, school situation, I. I had a chance. I could do one of two things. There was no money left in the 30s, which was pure depression time. My father used to have to send checks down to school every week or every month just to pay for the tuition. So he said, look, I've got $600 left, and you can take that and go to Columbia, where I had tried to register and go, and I was accepted. Or you can take the 600 bucks and go to Europe and do what you want, but it's entirely your deal to do and uh, make it work. So I spent $250 on transportation on an American merchant liner, and the rest of the money I managed to drag out for nine months. Came back in September, and while there, of course, uh, worked on my German and French and what have you, and uh, when I came back in September, I contacted my friend Ben. He said, you know, I think you ought to make it try at becoming a page or something like that at NBC. So sure enough, I did, and I was accepted. And that was when I first started working in the, what they called the guest relations department what, there. What, what, what year? So this was 1936? 1936, 1936 uh, in September. Was, was radio still magic to you at this point? Or was Everything it? was magic, really? obviously. By that, I had learned a lot in school, uh -huh. among other things, how to behave uh -huh. but and how was, to salute and everything. What did radio 
mean to a young kid growing up in the 20s? Radio years? was obviously the most important medium uh -huh. at the time. Right. And uh, one of the things that uh, happened, uh, anybody who started to work at NBC in, in whatever capacity, even if you were tabbed to be a producer or uh, in the uh, financial field and whatever, everybody who started work at NBC had to go through the page and guide staff first. I, I, I want to get into that, but I want to talk some more about radio. I mean, tell me about what it meant um, for a youngster growing up. What were your favorite shows, for instance, when you would listen, listen to radio? Oh, it's, it's a little hard to remember Anything? exactly. All, the, all this stuff, you, you know what people did in those days. Tell people me. huddled around the radio s set and, and listened to shows. And when you would go with Ben Larson into the studio, was it disappointing to see what was the action? No, it was, the reality? it was just very exciting. Uh -huh. Just to see it and to m meet the people. And 7-Eleven Fifth Avenue at that time was the uh, home port of uh, NBC. Right. Before they moved over to Rockefeller Center. Did you meet uh, Rudy Valley in those days? Uh, yes, I met everybody that Ben was involved with. Uh -huh. And uh, it was it was a super time. What about Milton Berle? Did you remember meeting him back in those days? I met Uncle Milty and he was doing, uh, it was before he became right. Uncle Milty obviously. He was doing a, uh, I don't remember exactly how it worked, but it was sort of a sing-along thing. And it was marvelous. He was his exuberant self as he later always was. Did you see any evidence of the ego that would... Oh yeah, he had lots of ego. Uh -huh. And his mother was always in evidence, and uh, it was it was an exciting time. So you uh, you, you joined the the guides the guides. Of, well, when when you go to NBC, tell us what you, you did with NBC. First, you start as a page. Right. It, there were three steps, and depending on your particular talents and desires. You started as a page, which meant you sat at a desk and answered questions or sold tickets to the studio tour, any of those things that people do even today. Uh, and if you were good or if you behaved or if people liked you, you then had a chance to become a guide, which was a step up. And uh, as a guide, uh, it was much more exciting because you got to take people around on tours and explain the whole uh, business of broadcasting to wherever it came. It was 40 cents to get on a tour in those days. Explain what you would do on the tour. There were set routines that you uh, did. You would take people uh, into studios to watch. There were, there were always observation booths of some kind for all the shows, for all the radio shows. And uh, you and the tour would go into an observation booth which had seats so that everybody could look down through a window at what was actually happening. And in those days, if you recall, radio was uh, one of those things where uh, they drew pictures by script and all these people would huddle around a uh, microphone and make you think that you were actually there and seeing this thing. And it was pretty exciting. But uh, What about the sound effects? Sound effects were great. As a guide, uh, you went into a, uh, into a small studio arrangement where they had a bunch of cathode ray tubes. And the tubes would have uh, various and sundry uh, signals coming through them so that you could see that the voice would make patterns on them. And uh, you did sound effects for them, as the radio people did. You had a bunch of little blocks which make made it sound like horses and coconut shells and uh, among the things were uh, uh, to be able to demonstrate something like scrambled eggs which was nothing more than a little piece of uh, cellophane which you crinkled in front of a microphone and uh, it got the idea across. Now who were some of the other uh, who were some of the other more famous uh, pages and guides who became famous later on? Oh. Uh, Dick Hames, singer, Dave Garraway, who was the first one to graduate out of the announcing class and got the first job. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it's it's a little hard to remember all of them. Well, didn't Dick okay. Hames have a favorite thing that he used to like to do there? Dick Hames, that deal where, where you went into this studio with your tour and had all these marvelous little waves going up and down was totally fascinating to him because he would stand in front of the microphone and sing and watch all these lines going, all these cathode ray kind of green lines, and he would spend hours singing to himself which apparently worked for him because he became rather famous. Before Garrow had graduated to, gra to the announcing school, moved to announcing school, did you have a sense that there was something great in for Dave Garrow? Yeah, he was, like he was, he was just a little older than most of the guys and was much smarter. Mm -hmm. His father was a, a, a rather famous engineer uh, optically. He ground the mirror for Palomar among other things. And Dave was very, he was a very smart guy. And, uh, but while, uh, while I was a guide, uh, I had a chance to do some rather interesting things. Among other things was the fact that uh, David Sarnoff had invited Albert Einstein to the studio and to take the tour. I happened to be the only guide who spoke German. So it fell to me to take him around on the tour which was just wonderful because this was the nicest, easiest man to talk to I've ever met. And uh, we went through the whole deal and when, when we wound up on the, uh, in front of the master control, which was this huge master control, all with the totally primitive equipment that we all had in those days, guys working dials and what have you. And uh, I think he, he was, uh, kindly disposed toward me because my name happened to be Feuerstein and his name was Einstein. <laughs> and I, that immediately got us together. I never had the courage to ask him what uh, E equals MC square meant, <laughs> but we got in front of the master control room and he said, yeah, das ist so kompliziert. That's so complicated, <laughs> which was interesting. What did he think of radio? Did you, have, did you have a sense of what he thought of the whole operation? He was very, you know, he was new to the country even. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he was already established in Princeton, mm -hmm. but uh, it was very, he had only come over here in 33, I believe. And uh, it, was, it was, the whole country was new to him. He loved it. When, when um, you were a guy taking people on tours, was there ever any mention of the coming of television at all? Yes, we kept hearing about television, and every once in a while we would be privileged to go someplace or other and see uh, the beginnings of television, which in the beginning were very, uh, rather crude. And uh, mostly what you saw was a picture on a, on a tube of Mickey Mouse, of a little statue of Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was Mickey Mouse or not, I but think it, it was, was Felix the Cat. Felix the Cat, right. yes, of course. Right. And uh, but we were all very intrigued with it, obviously. Was there a lot of talk about it? Was there a lot of excitement about it, or was it just one of the? No, things? it was one of the one of the things that was being promoted by RCA for a big thing in the future. Do you have any sense that it would change the world? I mean, was there talk about this thing that was going to change everything? It became very obvious after I got into the television business. But what, which about, was, what about before that? Uh, not, not that much because radio was still king and uh, television was uh, in the future. Was there talk among the guys that, oh, this thing isn't going to work or is No, just not that. No, they, the people just didn't pay that much attention, at least among the guides. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so how did you then, after you were a guide for a while, you wanted to move up, where did you move to? What, uh, as I told you before, uh, if you were a guide, once you got into that bracket, you were allowed, if you wanted to, if you had interest in that direction, you could go into an announcer's class, which at that time was run by a fellow named Dan Russell, a senior announcer. And as I said before, among the people on, in the class were Dave Garraway and several others whom I don't recall. Maybe 
Gene Rayburn might have been in there, and uh, or Gene Rubessa, as we call him, and a number of other guys. And uh, after you had gone through about six months of this class, you then were permitted, if you wanted to, on your own time. Well, as I said, Dave Garraway went through the class and got offered the first job, what, was which it, was in KDKA Pittsburgh. Was class tough? What would they teach you in class? They taught you all the things that you had to do under circumstances, like emergencies. What do you say if, if you lose the line? And uh, due to circumstances beyond our control, we will continue and then cut back to the studio for some kind of music, whatever. Mm -hmm. What else would they teach you? Uh, how to speak? Would they teach you diction? No. That you had to do on your own if you could. Mm -hmm. I was never terribly good at the way announcers spoke in those days. Announcers were very stentorian. Mm -hmm. they, there were like 40 announcers on Pat Kelly's staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the announcers spoke in deep, beautiful, pear-shaped tones. Mm -hmm. which didn't come naturally to me at all because I spoke at that time more or less I'm still able to talk today. Mm -hmm. But uh, after, after you got through the class, you were permitted then to do chores. And I was the only one who applied for this. What you could do, you could do standby duty, you could sign on the station, and uh, do all the menial things that the senior announcers who were making a bundle didn't want to do. How did the senior announcers make their money? From commercials. And so, and you doing standby duty, This can you explain what standby duty is and where it was done? You sat in a little standby booth with a control panel uh, where you occasionally had to turn a switch which would go from the red to the blue network if you had to, depending on the schedule. And then outside the booth that the announcer sat in was another small room that had a piano in it. And I remember very distinctly that uh, the pianist who was my standby pianist, if something went wrong, was a guy named Earl Wild, who became a very famous concert pianist. And the beauty was that he could take any piece of music, any pop music at all, and play it like Mozart, Beethoven, any of these things. He was a super talented man, and I think is still working. What was the point of the pianist? What was he do? Well, after you got through with saying uh, this thing isn't coming through anymore, you, you went to music. And that went because dead air is total death, as you know. If there's nothing coming through on the, uh, through the signal, it's terrible. You know, they think everything has died. So, uh, but uh, the way I finally got into the, into the radio business, actually, uh, as I said, we were allowed to do all these jobs. And living as I did at the time, at, on 48th Street, 58 West 48th Street, I could get up at 20 minutes to 6 in the morning, run like heck across the parking lot, where the garage now stands, the Rock Center garage, that was an open parking lot. So I ran out of my fifth floor apartment, down the stairs, ran across the parking lot, went in and signed on the station. What was your sign on? Uh, this is whatever it is. I, I don't know the exact words, but this, like this is WEAF, uh, broadcasting on a frequency of 660 or whatever it was. Or it might have been WJZ, it depends, because we had two networks in those days. But anyhow, I did this, that I did, along with all the other standby chores on all the soap operas. I still can't even look at a soap opera because I stood by on them all afternoon because they were on radio just as much as they are on television today. And uh, after doing this for Oh, then at 5 o'clock, when I stopped doing that, I would be a guide from 5 until midnight. And, and you would have to break into every 15 minutes and do, uh, we are here at WJZ. That's to right. You, you did the call letters and whatever else was obligatory. Did you ever blow it? Did you ever 
not flip the I got right. so tired working these many hours. I, I had like five hours sleep every, every night. And uh, frequently, being in a standby studio, when you had to throw that little switch to go from one network to the other, I'd be asleep. Thank God some kind guy up in master control realized that I hadn't done it. Why that was given to an announcer to do, I don't know. But in any case, you literally went from one network to another with a tiny little switch. And I slept through a couple of those, and uh, fortunately, the guys up in master control saved my neck. But I did this for about a year, and it was, it was arduous. And finally, an opening happened on Pat Kelly's announcing staff for a junior announcer, of which there were six. And uh, I heard later from a friend <laughs> that he was in the studio when the talk was going on, who do we get for this thing? Because there were a number of guys who were trying for the spot. And Pat Kelly, who was a tough old Irishman who had come from Australia on a sailing ship, said, gee, you know, he isn't any good, but I can't give it to anybody else because this bleep guy has been working the, the business out of himself for a whole year, and I can't give it to anybody else. So I got the job. And then I started to learn, hopefully, about what the broadcasting business was about. What was the pay for a junior announcer? $120 a month which was a big step up from $60 a month being a guide. But there was a catch with the junior announcer, right? The trouble was, at that time, the union was getting a real foothold in the broadcasting business. And uh, an outfit called AFRA, American Federation of Radio Artists, which later became AFTRA, including television. and. Uh, a tough old guy named Tom Tully kept after me because I was a holdout. The reason being that as a junior announcer, you could not audition for commercials. And unless you had a commercial, you could not become a senior announcer. So I held out to the bitter end, and this guy, everybody threatening me because I was the only holdout. But uh, finally, Pat Kelly came to me and said, listen, we're gonna, this is going to be a closed shop. You either join or no go. So I joined and had one of the early numbers because it was at the beginning of this thing. 